Good morning. In August 2018, a United Nations human rights panel cited credible reports that more than one million people were being in, held in counter-extremism centers in Xinjiang, the autonomous region uh, in the northwest corner of China. Beijing denied the scale of detentions, but later uh, they acknowledged that religious extremist Uyghurs were undergoing re-education and resettlement. Since then, we have been hearing more and more of the appalling abuses of the Uyghur people. My guest today is Dr. David Brophy. He is a senior lecturer in modern Chinese history at Sydney University, Australia. And uh, he is the author of the book named Uyghur Nation, Reform and Revolution on the Russia-China Frontier. Published by Harvard University Press in 2016, the book explores the history of modern Uyghur nationalism. Dr. Brophy, thank you very much for being with us, uh, with us today. Uh, hello, Shin. Very happy to be here. Um, I know you visited the uh, province last year and witnessed some of the uh, repressive pol policies in action there. But before talking about the actualities, I'd, I would like to ask first um, about the region's name uh, in the hope that maybe uh, you'll give us a brief history. Uh, uh, officially, it is Xinjiang, uh, or the new frontier, but many mm. Uyghurs call it East Turkestan. So, uh, mm. could you tell us a little bit about this difference, how important the name? Yes, that's an interesting place to start. So, so Xinjiang is a Chinese term, it, um, it means the new frontier, and it refers to the fact that, that Xinjiang was, uh, was added to the, uh, the Qing Empire in the 18th century, so it was literally uh, the new frontier uh, of the empire, and it's um, it's it's a term that you know has colonial connotations that people have identified, and Uyghurs have uh, often expressed unhappiness about that that term because it does very much uh, identify it as a as a product of a uh, of an act of conquest um, by by Beijing. Uh, there've been points at which uh, there've been alternative designations discussed, but. Um, there was an interesting debate in the early 1950s uh, when they were talking about uh, what to call what was then to become the, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, and, and Mao Zedong was very insistent that this term Xinjiang be, be retained. Um, so the um, you know the Chinese geographic perspective on this region was was uh, built into the designation, despite the fact that the the Chinese Communists at the time were granting this territory, a new status of an autonomous region. Uh, you're very correct to, to say that many Uyghurs prefer to talk about uh, Eastern Turkestan. That, that corresponds to a notion of Western Turkestan, which is uh, effectively those regions that used to belong to the, the Russian Empire, so the territories that are now the, uh, the independent republics of uh, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, um, Turkmenistan, and, and so on. And, and uh, Xinjiang as a region historically has a lot in common uh, with those territories culturally, uh, linguistically. So, um, you know, the, this talk of Eastern Turkestan has gone hand in hand with a, a, a sort of a wider notion of Turkestan itself as a, as a political region. Um, and this is a concept that has been um, embodied in, um, in political movements in Xinjiang, Particularly in the 1930s and 1940s, there were efforts to establish uh, East Turkestan republics um, at, at two points. And so that history is very much part of the, the political tradition that um, Uyghurs look back to. Although today the term East Turkestan is very much taboo inside China. Um, it's, it's more than enough to get you uh, arrested and interrogated to, to be using uh, a term like that. It's something that the Chinese state is extremely sensitive about. Um, if I may uh, draw an analogy uh, from Myanmar, actually, um, the, the regime, Myanmar regime denies that there are Rohingya people as a Muslim ethnic minority and argues that they are um, illegal immigrants from Bangladesh. Is there a similar argument or dispute regarding Uyghurs in China? Uh, not exactly, no. I mean, one of the... Um, um, one of the, the sort of key pillars of 
Communist Party policy uh, in minority regions such as Xinjiang was to recognize um, a certain claim to the, um, the territory by, by granting these regions autonomous status. Um, so, so Xinjiang is sometimes referred to as a province, but it's in fact not officially a province still. It's, a, it's an autonomous region. Um, and of course, we could debate how much genuine autonomy there is, but, but it does carry a certain recognition that the, the Uyghurs uh, do have a certain uh, claim to this, this territory. So no, there is an official recognition of the Uyghurs as a, um, uh, as a distinctive uh, ethnicity uh, with a distinctive history and culture uh, in, the, in this region. And that's all, um, that's all been enshrined in, in a sort of official notions of what constitutes uh, Uyghur identity. Uh, the state, in fact, has invested quite considerably in, in constructing that, you know, its own preferred notion of what it means to be a Uyghur and what is Uyghur culture. Uh, and so on, and you can still see that on display when you go to, to Xinjiang uh, today. But, of course, that recognition of, uh, of the distinctive uh, nationhood and culture of the Uyghurs also went hand in hand with this wider notion of the, um, the various ethnicities of China all belonging to a single uh, sort of supranation uh, of China. Um, and there's always been a tension between uh, allowing Uyghurs to identify uh, as Uyghurs and take pride in their, um, in what is distinctive about being Uyghur, uh, at the same time that the pressure on groups like this to, uh, to identify as Chinese and to orient politically and culturally towards uh, some kind of Chinese mainstream. Um, although they are, it is being, uh, um acknowledged uh, that there is a Uyghur nation or identity. Um, maybe we will talk about it later more de in detail. Uh, they, it is almost trying to be destroyed by the uh, Beijing nowadays. But um, I would like to uh, put it this way, my questions. As you put it in a recent article of yours, you say, in the name of combating, combating Islamic extremism, the Chinese Communist Party has embarked on a massive campaign of harassment and detention of Uyghurs in the Xinjiang province. I want to break up this phrase into two parts and then ask my question step to, in two steps. First step, I mean, combating Islamic extremism. What is it? I mean, is Saudi Arabia's Arabian Wahhabism or Salafism gaining ground in China or among Uyghurs? What is this? Well, this talk of Islamic extremism, that has been the overriding justification for China's policies in Xinjiang for, for quite a long time now. And it really goes back to the, um, the, uh, the launch of the global war on terror after 9-11. Uh, prior to that time, uh, the enemy for the party state in, in Xinjiang was usually identified as, as ethnic separatism, so uh, essentially Uyghur nationalism. Um, but at that point, there was a, um, there was a pivot towards a much greater emphasis on uh, Islamic extremism. And, um, and there were, the, China was able to win some international support for that, um, that rhetoric. Um, there was a sort of negotiation between China and the United States. The United States uh, recognized the, um, what was identified as a group called the East Turkestan Islamic Movement as a, as a terror organization. China then um, started identifying almost any incident of unrest or violence in China, uh, Xinjiang, as the actions of the East Turkestan Islamic Movement. And all of this was usually done with very little um, evidentiary basis or, um, uh, you know, certainly uh, any transparency. Um, there's, there's, you know, a lot of scepticism um, expressed by scholars towards the, the nature of these organizations and, um, you know, how active they actually were uh, inside, um, inside China. Um, but nonetheless, um, that evolved into a concept of what China calls the three evil forces. Um, the three evil forces being terrorism, um, uh, religious extremism, and, um, and, uh, and uh, ethnic separatism. Uh, and so that is now the banner under which they're, you know, this is the, these are the bogeymen still uh, that China claims to be combating. Um, but what it actually means to, to, to combat Islamic extremism and radicalization, that has 
undergone quite a significant shift uh, in recent times because, you know, it used to be quite a sort of targeted focus on, um, you know, underground um, educational networks, you know, Quran classes that were, um, you know, being carried on, what was identified as illegal religious activities. Um, but in recent times, there's been much more of a shift to a sort of a, a, a preemptive notion of combating radicalization. This is familiar, uh, you know, from examples elsewhere uh, in the world um, in this, the, the domestic war on terror, this idea that you, you, you can start identifying people who might be susceptible to radicalization by certain behavioral indicators uh, and so on. And then the, the net just gets wider and wider um, once you start doing that. Now we've reached the point um, where hundreds of thousands of people, possibly more than a million, um, find themselves, um, you know, suspected of being vulnerable to, to radicalization and being um, being detained in these internment camps. Um, then, secondly, uh, is this campaign of uh, uh, re-education, as they mm. put it, or uh, preemptive uh, changing? You know, the, 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 is mm. this? A campaign region specific or people specific? I mean, uh, does the Chinese government uh, target only the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, or are there any other Uyghurs uh, populations living in other regions of China who are also being targeted, or, and other Muslim communities? Yeah, a good question again. Um, the the particular policy of the internment camps is specific to. To Xinjiang. Now, there are some Uyghurs living elsewhere in the interior of China, in, in Beijing, Shanghai, but it's become increasingly difficult for Uyghurs to live in places like that because of restrictions that they face, discrimination. Um, you know, it's very difficult for Uyghurs to travel throughout China because uh, hotels just, you know, frequently uh, refuse to offer accommodation to Uyghurs. And so for all these these types of reasons, um, you know, there aren't large Uyghur communities um, outside of, of Xinjiang. And then, now, the camps are not exclusively targeting the Uyghur population. That's that's an important point to emphasise here. Um, this is um, a policy that is uh, drawing in people from other um, Muslim uh, minority groups in, in Xinjiang. So uh, there's certainly evidence of... Uh, of Kazakhs being caught up in this policy, Kyrgyz uh, in the south uh, of Xinjiang, uh, possibly also a, uh, a smaller contingent of, uh, of Chinese, um, Chinese-speaking Muslims, the, sort of the, the Hui population. Um, there's, um, you know, we could talk more about um, policies uh, towards Muslims elsewhere in China, but we, we're not seeing anything on the scale of this uh, the, the camp network and the surveillance um, and the, the counter-terror drills and all of these things that um, Muslim minorities in, in Xinjiang are being subjected to. Uh, this is this is a uh, Xinjiang has sort of become an a, you know a zone for experimentation um, with uh, repressive policies in, in China. The, the, this, there are certain elements of these policies that were um, imported from Tibet a couple of years ago, but there's been innovations, and the, the camp is the camp system is certainly one of them. Now, you know, it's entirely possible to imagine that elements of this this suite of policies will then be, um, you know, introduced uh, elsewhere across the country. Um, but uh, we're not seeing a, a lot of that just yet. Uh, I would like to come to the zone of experimentation phrase uh, again, but before that, then should I ask? I mean, Xinjiang holds um, uh, holds crucial energy assets, as we know, and also it is a key hub uh, in China's um, this Belt and Road Initiative, which uh, it, it seems um, a very big project, very ambitious project uh, that will connect. Uh, Central Asia to the Middle East and maybe mm. to the world. I mean, yeah. Mm. So, uh, is it because they don't want anything uh, that they don't like in this region? Um, well, I think that um, there's a, there is a real difficulty in putting our finger on exactly what is motivating the party for these particular policies at this particular point in time, but certainly. Um, the, um, the, the grand vision that, that China has for 
um, turning Xinjiang outward uh, and making it into the the, um, the the political and economic center of uh, of Central Asia. That's that's certainly a major goal for the um, the party in Xinjiang. Xinjiang borders on eight different countries. Um, some of those connections, the infrastructure has not been particularly good up until now, but there are efforts to uh, develop that um, in a number of different directions. And some of these are very important um, for, the, uh, for, for China's uh, strategic planning. For example, the connection to Pakistan, which will uh, provide a, a conduit for uh, energy resources coming up through, um, through Pakistan. If, for example, China finds itself blockaded in the South China Sea or something like that, this is something that you know, really is at the heart of um, the party's policy for guiding its transition to, to great power status. Um, so certainly creating a stable platform um, for this, um, this push is, is definitely part of the consideration for, for what they're doing now. Um, you visited the province uh, last year, uh, as I know, I, I think uh, the last time it was last year. And what did you see in Xinjiang? Because um, you put it as um, like this in, in your article, Xinjiang today resembles occupied territory. Um, yeah, and the, the Uyghurs as an internal enemy. Could you describe what you have seen there? Yeah, well, I've, look, I've never actually visited a, a live war zone, but um, there were lots of elements to the, the, the urban landscape that, um, that, that, that left me feeling that that was what I was, was looking at. Um, there's, um, the first thing you notice when you arrive in Xinjiang are the new police stations on almost every major intersection. Um, then you'll start going through checkpoints. These are, these are new on almost every major street. Um, with different um, degrees of stringency. So sometimes you, you have to get out and register and, you know, it takes a long time. Um, you see long lines of Uyghurs lining up to get through these checkpoints. Um, there's a separate lane, um, which is where, um, you know, you would see uh, Chinese drivers being waved through. Um, there's, um, you know, public buildings um, covered in barbed wire, um, new hev heavy metal barricades, um, you know, soldiers at tourist sites um, in, in, you know, in body armor and, and helmets uh, with machine guns. Um, I saw, a, you know, the, the center of Kashgar shut down on a, you know, normal working day um, while a parade of armored vehicles and, um, and soldiers marched through chanting slogans about maintaining stability uh, and so on, in a, you know, in a, in a very aggressive way. There's... Um, there's a lot of things you see on the street um, in terms of what Uyghurs are having to live with uh, at this point. Um, you know, I saw a young men being stopped by um, heavily armed police and having their, their cell phones checked um, to see if they had any, um, you know, any any messages or any, um, you know, any digital media that was, you know, suspicious on their their phones. Um, I saw I saw elderly people being um, um, drilled in the streets, you know, carrying large clubs to you know, participate in, you know, what the, the, the state refers to as the people's war on terror. Um, these sort of loyalty rituals, you know, people every week being required to go and attend uh, flag raising ceremonies where they swear loyalty to the party and so on. All of these, um, this, this, um, which is just the sort of the daily routine for, for Uyghurs now. Now, I mean, I should say that, that Xinjiang has, you know, in the, in the 15 or 18 years that I've been interested in and studying it, it's never presented a particularly happy picture. Um, but all of this, all of this was new. It was really, uh, really shocking to me. And, and, and then, so on, and, and on top of all that, then you have the camp situation, so which I, I wasn't really able to think um, about. But, but already, um, even leaving that aside, uh, this, the region is going through an intense period of repression. Will you be able to go back to China after, uh, you know, making this program or writing articles about what you have seen there? Um, I've been reasonably public um, about the, you know, my experiences in, in Xinjiang and talking to people um, uh, in the past. I, it's not the case um, as yet, that that China is is banning visitors to to Xinjiang, 
Um, I, you know, I, I was not um, certain of being able to get a visa last time I went, and I, and I did, and I, and I, I hope that I will in the future. Um, but, you know, many of us who work in this field have, have realised that it's well past the time that we should be worrying about um, things like that. We, we've invested um, time and effort to, um, you know, to study this region and we have, you know, been able to, you know, enjoy access to, um, you know, to, to resources and study opportunities that, that people inside Xinjiang simply don't have, have access to. And, um, I certainly feel you know a very strong responsibility to to talk to anyone who's interested um, about this um, this particular question. But but while it is true that some scholars of Xinjiang have been um, banned uh, in the past, it doesn't appear to be a a, a general policy uh, of China to to ban people. And, and generally speaking, you know Xinjiang is not like to bet where there is a system where you you do have to apply for special permission to to visit. Um, there's still many people visiting Xinjiang. There's many tourists visiting Xinjiang. When I was there last year, it was it was, um, it was sort of baffling to me to see so many tourists. In fact, particularly Chinese tourists, because um, the the environment was um, you know so so grim and and so uh, you know so depressing that I can't imagine anyone really wanting to take a holiday there right now. Um, but yes, I do hope to visit Xinjiang again in the future and hopefully uh, happier times. Um, uh, Dr. Brophy, you compare, you, you're making comparisons with Tibet and I think uh, my question will be related to that because I think um, in lots of many of the articles, um, people mention, and also I think you will mention it too, after Chen Kuangguo's appointment as the governor mm. of Xinjiang, who came, who transferred mm. from Tibet, uh, things mm. dramatically change in the um, region. Mm. Um, I think he had this uh, repressive strategies uh, to control population in Tibet, and he was successful. And now uh, <laughs> it's like, as you say, he is experimenting, and maybe uh, he's getting bigger and bigger laboratories mm. from Tibet to now Xinjiang, maybe it will uh, be a much bigger one, whole China. What do you say? Yeah, I think there's some truth to what you're saying. I think that um, his personal ambitions may play a role uh, in this. Um, I think that um, certainly in terms of the police stations, the, um, the digital surveillance, things like that were, um, were regarded as um, having achieved some success. Uh, in Tibet, and so he, he, you know, he felt he was on a roll, um, and I guess he, um, you know, he went the next step um, with the the camps and so on, and and that may reflect, I think, what it, something that you hear quite often when you're talking to people um, in China, this this idea that um, you know Tibet is, you know, to, they've got Tibet in hand. Um, Tibet is not the same scale of issue uh, as Xinjiang. I think for some time now the party has been more worried about Xinjiang than they've been worried about um, Tibet. Um, you know, partly because the um, um, because you know Xinjiang is an issue that um, has so many connections to to international issues. Um, you know, it's um, it's a region that's always been um, you know a thoroughfare of ideas and. Um, peoples and, and ideologies, and it's, we're talking about the Silk Road here, um, and this, you know, th this means that, um, and politically, it's it's a region that has faced West, um, its connections to the Islamic world, its connections to the Russian and, and Soviet world, these have always been, um, um, you know, alternative sources of inspiration and um, you know, for, for people living in Xinjiang to, to Beijing. And, Beijing, I think, really feels that it has difficulty um, in in turning Xinjiang um, back, you know, in the direction of um, in, of Beijing. Um, but you know, I've never been to Tibet. I can't draw a direct comparison my, myself. But um, certainly, um, many of the same issues, uh, many of the same issues too, in terms of you know what sort of international response is necessary uh, in the case of Xinjiang. Um, as, as arose in the case of Tibet. 
Um, how about the ordinary Chinese people? Do they know about what's going on in Xinjiang? I mean, uh, recently, for example, we can see via feeds in CCTV these education camps, um, which, which, and or people, they are talking to people, which seem to be very happy of being re-educated and, you know, finding jobs and kind of... Is this the same in China? How the ordinary Chinese react? And also, how the ethnic Chinese Muslims react? Yeah, those are good questions. Um, I don't believe that there's a lot of reporting um, on the, the situation in Xinjiang on, on Chinese media for domestic audiences. Um, I, I, I could be wrong about that, but I think that... Um, Largely, people outside of Xinjiang are being kept in the dark um, as to, to what is going on. Um, now, obviously, China is a place where, um, you know, news can get around by various other sources. Um, and, you know, there's, um, there's, um, uh, there are a lot of Chinese people in, in Xinjiang as well. I mean, the province, the region, pardon me, is, uh, you know, it's almost 50% um, Chinese now. We, we don't have recent census figures. Um, and the sort of the anecdotal evidence, interestingly, is that a lot of Chinese there are getting fed up with these policies too, that this is, you know, this is putting a drag on the economy, this is making life difficult. Um, even if you're not targeted directly, this is just, um, you know, this is a real impediment to living a normal life and, and um, you know, going back to business and taking advantage of what was supposed to be, you know, uh, you know economic opportunities. Um, in the um, in this frontier region, and, and um, some people may be actually heading heading home, um, leaving Xinjiang. We don't can't say much more than that, but but certainly, you know, word must be getting around. Um, and I think it's a really interesting question as to how um, how ordinary Chinese are thinking about this um, among the Chinese Muslims elsewhere. So you know, if we say the Uyghur population is about 11, 12 million, there's there's about the same number of um, Chinese-speaking Muslims way scattered throughout China, um, but concentrated in neighboring regions such as uh, Gansu and then the Ningxia Hui Autonomous Region. And they've um, and there's been some turbulence there politically uh, as well. Um, there's been a, um, a, a bit of a crackdown in some of those areas towards what is regarded as um, uh, you know, excessive um, emphasis on the Islamic identity of these regions, whether it's in terms of, you know, place names or um, people insisting, you know, on, on, you know, the use of halal um, food and, and so on. And um, there's all sorts of um, um, sort of uh, stories circulating throughout China now about, about this kind of thing. You, you often hear people talking about how you know, the Muslims are, um, they're being too aggressive with their, their use of, you know, their, their halal, this, this halalification of these Muslim regions is something that you um, you hear um, people talking about. And this, this fits in with a, a, a wider um, discourse, which I, you know, I think taps into a lot of international um, uh, Islamophobic um, Themes. Um, it's it, it it exists in symbiosis with um, Chinese discussion about um, you know Muslim migration to Europe and, and these kinds of things. This idea that you know Europe has been ruined by Muslim migration and we can't allow that to happen uh, here in China. This this type of thing. There's a whole world online now of um, you know quite um, quite nasty anti-Muslim um, discussion taking place among, among ordinary Chinese. Um, of course, you'll find voices too who are willing to speak up um, for these people, but, but that's much more dangerous to do so. Um, it, it, it seems that the party is allowing a certain level of um, anti-Muslim um, agitation to, to go on, um, while it's very likely that anyone speaking up to criticize policies in Xinjiang or, or Ningxia um, will uh, will risk um, the eye of the state falling on them. Oh, we understand that very well. Uh, in Turkey as well. Uh, countries with the Muslim populations, for example, including Turkey, also have been silent mostly. Um, I mean, is it, uh, do you surprise with this? Or is it normal, do you think, that China is a very, um, you know, because... Um, 
they can use economic power yeah. and you know yeah well am i surprised um, not particularly there's you know we live in a world of intense geopolitical rivalries now um, most states do not put human rights um, as a high priority on their on their policy uh, agenda um, naturally i think we would hope um, that our political leaders um, would be willing to, to speak honestly about the situation uh, in Xinjiang and, and criticize what is going on. I don't think anyone should have any hesitation uh, in, in doing so. Um, but, you know, if we take the case of, you know, the Muslim world, for example, um, I would, um, you know, not be pinning my hopes necessarily on, um, you know, um, a place like Egypt or Saudi Arabia being willing to, to, to speak out too strongly on questions of, of human rights. Um, the, you know, the, the explanation that people often provide for this is that these countries are, you know, very concerned about their economic ties to, to China. There may well be some truth to that, um, uh, but it's important, I think, to recognize that what the starting point is here, that the Uyghurs have never had an easy time in, um, in, in, you know, attracting sympathy for their cause um, around the world, um, you know, be it in the West or uh, in, the, in the Islamic world, um, even at points where China was very weak, not able to exert any economic pressure or political pressure uh, on countries. It was very, very difficult for Uyghurs to, um, to, to find a hearing um, for their issues as well. There's still, I think, a, you know, a lot of um, a lot of basic ignorance about um, this um, about this situation, um, and um, you know I, I think that um, wherever we are, we do need to be raising our voices and um, and, and asking our political leaders to to, to do the same. Um, but we do need to recognise that there are some you know there are some serious flaws currently in the. In the institutional architecture, what we call the international community um, around questions of human rights, it's very common um, for states to avoid taking positions um, on various questions, you know, uh, for their own particular interests. And it's equally common for states to simply brush off um, the criticism of those types of organisations uh, as well. Um, so we do need to we do need to pursue this this. Um, this type of you know awareness raising, um, China is definitely conscious of its image. Um, okay, maybe but it's not going to be. Oh, uh, I hope we keep you a few minutes more. And um, lately, I mean, regarding your um, Western Islamophobia uh, point, I mean, since now US and China are in a collision course, if I may say yeah. so, um, any yeah. criticism coming from the US uh, is being dismissed as a you know, um, desire of dominance uh, yeah. in, the, in the region, yeah. United, States, uh, United States dominance. Yeah. And also, China accuses of um, United States as with double standards. Uh, because, uh, and I think everybody agrees with that, that the United States yeah. is double standard, uh, using yeah. double standards. So uh, how might uh, the... Especially Trump administration's Islamophobia uh, mm. and also the atmosphere will affect um, in this dispute. Mm. Yeah, look, that's a really interesting question. Um, the, um, the clearly, clearly, um, the um, you know the accusation of hypocrisy hits home when we're talking about the U.S. And I don't think we should shy away from that. I think that we, should, you know, every time China um, accuses. Uh, outsiders of hypocrisy. I think we need to just take that as an opportunity to, um, you know, to 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 um, to address the issues that exist in our own society. Um, where exactly um, someone like Trump would fall on this issue, <laughs> I don't think anyone really knows. Um, but what we can say is that that Mike Pence has uh, integrated the Uyghur issue into his list of grievances um, against China. He's been making some very uh, very belligerent speeches. Uh, in his tour of Asia recently, and he has brought up the, the Uyghur question. Now, obviously, I think that that does raise um, some, some issues as to how far we want this issue to be identified with the other wider US objectives uh, in Asia. I, I think that it's important to keep these things um, 
quite uh, quite distinct. So I do recognise uh, the issue um, that that we're raising here. Um, but look, I do also think that you know we're we're a long, long way from the point where you know America is in a position to use this issue to to, to somehow try to destabilise China uh, or anything like that. Um, I think that um, acknowledging um, you know all of the um, the issues, it's still incumbent on us to um, to be um, you know, to be upfront in our criticism about what's going on, um, particularly on you know among progressives who might you know have strong criticisms about um, the U.S. U.S. behaviour in the war on terror. Uh, my own country, Australia, has been criticised for its response um, to the war on terror, its own legislation. Um, around questions of um, detention uh, and so on. But the basic point is that there's, there's nothing progressive about China's policies uh, in, in Xinjiang. China is a major capitalist power. It's on its way to becoming uh, a, a superpower. It's just not viable to us to say that we oppose racism and Islamophobia um, in, in the US, um, but, but not in China. That's, um, that's just not a credible position for anyone to, to hold. So David Brockley, thank you very much. Uh, it was great speaking to you. Um, you enlightened us a little bit of the issue, but unfortunately, I, I think we will be speaking about this issue more and more in the coming days since the, uh, it doesn't seem that the repression will stop any, uh, anytime soon. Indeed, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for taking an interest uh, in this. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. We spoke to Dr. David Brophy from Australia regarding the China's repression to Uyghur uh, population uh, in China. And our programs will keep going on a whole day. Thank you for watching us.